She is the poor little rich girl who overcame huge obstacles to become first lady of the world. At the age of nine, she took control of her own destiny, transforming herself from a shy, fearful girl into a strong, socially aware, and confident woman. As the first lady of the United States, she took a ceremonial title and turned it into a platform to help others, and then went even further and developed the Magna Carta of the modern age, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In today's biographics, we examine the very busy life of Eleanor Roosevelt. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt was born into one of the richest families in America, the New York Roosevelts, on October 11, 1884. Her parents, Elliot and Anna, were prominent New York socialites. Anna was a strikingly beautiful woman who loved finery and perfection. Eleanor could tell from an early age that she was a disappointment to her mother, though. She was not pretty enough, and she was too shy and awkward. In Eleanor's eyes, her father Elliot was a heroic figure. He was handsome, rugged, and manly, which is not surprising considering that he was the brother of the future president and quintessential man of action, Theodore Roosevelt. Elliot was a hunter who would travel around the world collecting trophies and stories with which he would entrance his little girl. Elliot and Eleanor, who he called Nelly, shared a very special bond. She later recalled, With my father, I was perfectly happy. He was the center of my world, and all around him loved him. But Elliot had a not-so-secret vice. He was a raging alcoholic. When he wasn't playing polo or hunting elephants in Africa, he could be found at the Meadowbrook Country Club drinking away the day. He was an anxious, moody young man who was never able to relax. Often he would go on extended drinking binges to eventually stagger through the door in an apoplectic state. By her own assessment, Eleanor was a plain-looking child, without beauty, and she was also painfully shy. She was raised in the midst of privilege and wealth. Family, they lived in a townhouse in Manhattan that was staffed full of servants. The infant Eleanor was cared for by a French nurse. As a result, she learned to speak French before she could even speak English. When he broke his ankle in 1893, Elliot began adding laudanum and morphine to his diet of mood-altering substances. Anna tried to help him break his substance dependence, but it was all to no avail. Then, after the birth of their second child, Elliot Jr. in 1889, there was a kind of family intervention spearheaded by his older brother Teddy. He convinced Elliot to leave the family and head south in order to clean himself up. Elliot returned after a few months, better, but not cured. He would wander the house at night, desperately looking for a drink in order to help him deal with his chronic depression. At a wit's end, Anna persuaded him to take the family on a tour of European health resorts. For six-year-old Eleanor, the trip was absolutely magical. Having been separated from him for months, she was now able to spend every minute with her beloved papa. She went out of her way to please him, dreading nothing more than displeasing him. For his part, Elliot loved everything about his daughter, apart from one thing. She later recalled, I was not only timid, I was afraid of everything, of mice, of the dark, of imaginary dangers. In reminiscing about her childhood, Eleanor recalled in her autobiography, Looking back, childhood and my youth was one long battle against fear. By the time that a third child, a boy named Hall, came along in 1891, Elliot was back to his heavy drinking. The family were in Paris, and Elliot's condition had become so bad that he was now confined to a sanatorium. It was now that big brother Theodore Roosevelt stepped in in order to take charge. He sailed to Paris to confront his wayward brother. He ordered him to spend two years apart from the family in order to overcome his demons. He could reunite with his family when he had proven to Theodore that he was a changed man. On his return to the States, Elliot settled down in a small town in Virginia. Back in New York, Anna was miserable. She missed her husband desperately and seemed to be bitter with everything and everyone. Eleanor was just as miserable. She couldn't understand why her beloved father had gone away, and she missed him terribly. Anna hired a private tutor for Eleanor, who would teach the girl in the upstairs parlor of their Manhattan townhouse. When Eleanor was seven, her mother began getting severe migraine headaches. She would cloister herself in her bedroom with all of the shades drawn for days on end. Eleanor would spend hours sitting by her bedside, gently rubbing her mother's forehead. For the first time in her life, she felt as if she were actually being useful to Anna. Anna had surgery for an unknown illness just before Eleanor turned eight. Following the operation, she came down with diphtheria. Within days, the 29-year-old mother of three, she was dead. 
Eleanor was sent to live with relatives. She was soon told that her father was on his way to see her. This ray of light, it outshone the sadness of her mother's passing. She created the fantasy that she and her father would go off and live together in some faraway place. But that wasn't to be. Anna had stipulated in her will that the children were to be raised by her mother, Mary Livingston Ludlow. As a result, Anna found herself living in a gloomy Manhattan brownstone house. In the spring, both of Eleanor's brothers, they contracted scarlet fever. The baby got better, but three-year-old Elliot Jr.'s condition, it developed into diphtheria. And unfortunately, he died. Anna's only happiness came with the infrequent visits of her father. But Elliot, he was still drinking heavily, and Eleanor's grandmother put a stop to the visits. In the summer of 1894, Elliot suffered a fall while in a drunken stupor. He fell into a coma and ultimately died. Eleanor, she was devastated. She later wrote, I continued living in my dream world as usual. From that time, I knew in my mind that my father was dead, but yet I lived with him more closely, probably, than when he was alive. Eleanor and younger brother Hall, they were now orphaned, and they lived with their grandmother and her four grown children in the Manhattan house. They were raised with the strictest discipline. Her grandmother made Eleanor dress like a little girl in dark and gloomy clothing. This invited ridicule from the other girls in the neighborhood. At the age of 14, Eleanor was allowed to attend her aunt's annual Christmas party. She absolutely hated it. Later writing, the others all knew each other and saw each other often. They were all so much better at winter sports. I knew, of course, that I was different from all the other girls, and if I had not known, they were frank in telling me so. That evening, she stood dejectedly against a wall and watched her cousin Alice dancing with an attractive distant cousin by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Eleanor was mortified when, after the dance was finished, the 16-year-old boy approached her and asked her for the next dance. At the age of 15, in fulfillment of her mother's wishes, Eleanor was sent to the Allenswood Academy, a finishing school just outside of London, England. She spent three years there from 1899 to 1902. The academy was headed by a French woman named Marie Souvestre. The goal of the academy was to turn out independent thinking young women who challenged the stereotypical role of women in society. Eleanor, she flourished in this environment. Madame Souvestre only allowed the girls to speak French, which put Eleanor at an immediate advantage. She was a fluent speaker and spent the first evening evening in animated conversation with the headmistress while the other girls sat around nervously. Eleanor quickly gained the confidence and self-assuredness that she had been lacking at home. She immediately became a favorite among the girls and was a bit of a teacher's pet. It was from Madame Souvestre that she developed a compassion for the less privileged members of society and a desire to use her privileged position to help others. In 1902, Eleanor returned to New York. The 17-year-old was ready to be presented to high society. This occurred by way of a special coming-out party. It was a night that she did not remember fondly, writing, It was simply awful. It was a beautiful party, of course, but I was so unhappy because a girl who comes out is so utterly miserable if she does not know all the young people. Of course, I had been so long abroad that I had lost touch with all the girls I used to know in New York. I was miserable through all that. With that painful experience out of the way, Eleanor started to get involved in settlement work in New York. Encouraged by her uncle Theodore, she began to work to improve the living conditions of New York's poor people. Her work consisted of exposing the terrible working conditions of the many sweatshops that employed children and women for dangerous work, for a pittance of pay. During the summer of 1902, Eleanor was on a train to visit her grandmother when she happened to meet up with a boy who had asked her to dance at the Christmas party all of those years ago. Franklin Roosevelt was the fifth cousin of Eleanor's father. The pair struck up a conversation, with Eleanor soon discovering that this young man had a lot of depth to him. He was interested in the social concerns that she was passionate about and was fascinated when she described the working conditions that she had witnessed. Eleanor and Franklin maintained a correspondence which eventually developed into a romance. They were engaged on November the 22nd, 1903. Franklin's mother, Sarah Ann Delano, was opposed to the union and tried to dissuade her son, but to no avail. Wedding plans were made with adjustments to fit with Uncle Theodore, who was now the President of the United States. Teddy proudly gave away the bride on March 17, 1905. Because of the president's attendance, the wedding was the talk of the town. After the nuptials were completed, the couple went on a three-month honeymoon tour of Europe. Returning to New York, they moved into a New York townhouse that was paid for by Franklin's mother, who was still not happy with her son's choice of wife. The home was connected to Sarah's residence by a sliding door, and she ran the roost in both dwellings, much to Eleanor's chagrin.
Over a period of 10 years, starting in 1906, the Roosevelts they would have six children. Still, Eleanor liked neither the act of procreation nor the fact of being a mother. She later wrote that, It did not come naturally to me to understand little children or to enjoy them. While Eleanor spent her time raising children, her husband progressively climbed the political ladder. By 1918, he had already served as a New York State Senator and was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He had also been busying himself with more amorous affairs. Eleanor was unpacking her husband's suitcase one day when she stumbled across a stack of love letters that were addressed to him. They were from her social secretary, a girl named Lucy Mercer. It turns out that Franklin had become disillusioned with his domestic life and was planning to divorce Eleanor and take up with Lucy. But when his mother threatened to disinherit him if he caused such a scandal, he changed his mind. From that point on, Eleanor consigned herself to a loveless marriage of political convenience. She threw herself into her social work, which was the only thing that really gave her pleasure. During the war years, Eleanor worked as a volunteer for the Navy Relief Society and the American Red Cross. Then, in 1919, she became a translator for the International Congress of Working Women. In 1920, Franklin, who was known to the public as FDR, ran on the Democratic ticket for Vice President of the United States. The Republicans, though, they won the White House that year, and Roosevelt returned to his law practice in New York. In August 1921, the Roosevelts vacationed at their resort home in New Brunswick, Canada. At that time, there was an international polio epidemic around the world. Franklin contracted the illness, and he became paralyzed from the waist down. Eleanor threw herself into the role of nurse and comforter. She convinced her husband to remain in politics, despite his mother's urgings that he retire and live out his life as a country gentleman. Throughout the early 1920s, Franklin underwent a torturous routine of physical therapy. Eleanor was at his side the entire time. Yet she also found time to extend her own social activity, joining the Women's Trade Union League, an organization that worked to achieve fair treatment and better salaries for working women. She also became a board member of the Women's City Club of New York. She developed her public speaking ability and became an in-demand speaker around New York. During this period, Eleanor also founded a business called Valkyll Industries. This was a furniture factory which employed women to build and decorate colonial-style furniture. As if all of this wasn't enough to keep the mother of six busy, she was also the co-owner and a teacher at the Todd Hunter School for Girls in New York City. By 1928, FDR was ready to re-enter the political arena. Again, Eleanor, she was right by his side. He ran for and became the governor of New York. Eleanor, she was now the first lady of New York. She was very active in the role, becoming, according to her husband, his eyes and legs. Even though FDR's inability to walk was hidden from the public, Eleanor did all of the traveling for him. In the process, she delivered speeches on his behalf. The position gave her an ideal opportunity to fulfill her social agenda. In 1932, FDR was propelled to the White House. On March 4, 1933, Eleanor was sworn in as the First Lady of the United States. It was a role that she had been dreading. She had known every First Lady of the 20th century up until that time and was certainly not keen to spend her days hosting luncheons and planning state occasions. From the very outset, Eleanor was determined to revolutionize the role of the First Lady. She saw the role as the ultimate position of influence by which she could bring real change for the underprivileged. She continued and even extended her social activities. Two days after becoming First Lady, Eleanor set the stage by holding the first ever press conference held by a First Lady. She would go on to hold another 347 of these conferences during her husband's presidency. She also began writing a daily newspaper column, which became a major platform for her to espouse her views. The column was widely syndicated all across the country. The most important year to take in Eleanor's message was, of course, her husband. She brought him stories from all over the country of the hardship and injustice that people were facing. This no doubt had an influence on many of FDR's policies during the New Deal that was in place during the Depression years. Eleanor was responsible for bringing a civil rights agenda to the White House. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution denied black singer Marian Anderson the right to perform at Carnegie Hall. Eleanor immediately came to Anderson's aid and was instrumental in organizing an open-air concert at the Lincoln Memorial that was attended by 75,000 people. During World War II, Eleanor's role it became international in its scope. She undertook a dangerous trip to the South Pacific Theater of War in order to bolster the troops. The following year, she undertook a goodwill tour of Latin America. 
She wanted to do more, including going to Europe to work for the International Red Cross, but was dissuaded by presidential advisers. Eleanor, she actively lobbied to allow European refugee children to immigrate to the United States, along with Jews and other groups who were under Nazi oppression. She was partially successful helping 83 Jewish refugees into the country on one occasion. At the end of the war, however, she stated that her greatest regret that she was unable to convince the president to accept more escapees from Nazi tyranny. With the war drawing to a successful conclusion, Franklin Roosevelt, he suddenly died. On April 12, 1945, he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage while visiting Warm Springs, Georgia. Eleanor's grief it was complicated by the information that her husband's longtime mistress, Lucy Mercer Rutherford, had been with him when he died. Franklin had never given up on Lucy, despite giving that impression to Eleanor. Letters and phone calls continued throughout the 1920s. During the White House years, he would invite Lucy to visit when Eleanor was away. FDR recruited his daughter Anna to help arrange these clandestine visits. Anna knew the depth of the relationship, and she was a willing accomplice. This is something that deeply hurt Eleanor when she learned about it after her husband's death. There has been a lot of speculation regarding Eleanor's extramarital activity. The focus of the attention is on a political reporter by the name of Lorena Hickok. Lorena and Eleanor they became constant companions. There are many surviving letters between the couple that could be interpreted as being romantic in nature. It is also common knowledge that Hickok was a lesbian. The relationship may or may not have been physical, but there is little doubt that the two women certainly loved each other. Finding herself suddenly out of the White House, Eleanor retired to the family estate at Hyde Park. She could see no future as a public person and made up her mind to simply fade into the sunset. But new president Harry Truman, he had other ideas. He called Eleanor the first lady of the world and offered her a position as a delegate to the newly created United Nations. Her sense of duty, it kicked in and she accepted the role. In 1946, she became the first chairperson of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. She was instrumental in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, working with the UN until 1953. The final decade of Eleanor's life was spent giving speeches and making occasional appearances. Throughout the 1950s, she gave an average of 150 speeches a year, many of them on behalf of the United Nations. She received a slew of awards and honorary titles and was the first recipient of the annual Franklin Delano Roosevelt Brotherhood Award in 1946. In 1960, Eleanor was diagnosed with aplastic anemia following an accident in which she was hit by a car in New York. She was treated with steroids, but this made things worse. A dormant case of tuberculosis in her bone marrow was activated, and it was this that led to the cardiac arrest that killed her on November 7, 1962. She was 78 years old. The following day, President Kennedy ordered that every U.S. flag around the world must be lowered to half-mast as a tribute to the First Lady of the World. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below and do not forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several times a week. So subscribe to make sure you get those. Also, why not check out my other channel called Top Tens? You'll find a link to that in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.